The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Sherry Lynn Phelps, and I am the Agronomy Manager with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, and will be moderating the webinar today. We also have Andrea Lauder, our Communications Manager, who's done all the heavy lifting in terms of organizing the webinar and looking after the functioning administration, as well as the CCA credit. We both welcome you to our second Pulse webinar for 2020, and it's good to see so many people taking advantage of this webinar in a time when social distancing is key as we deal with COVID-19. I hope this webinar finds you and your loved ones well and that you are ready for about an hour of great information. A bit on the administration side before we get started. To get CCA credits for today's webinar, you must be watching it live. Andrew will send out an email after the webinar requesting your number, and if more than one person is watching from one computer, you'll need someone to verify those in attendance. The webinar will be recorded and posted to our website for future viewing. And for today's webinar, all webinar or all participants will be muted. We will be happy to take questions during the presentation, and you can enter your questions by typing them into the question poll on the side of the GoToWebinar. And we will hold all questions to the end of the presentation where they will be addressed. Today's speaker is Dr. Shama Chatterton. Dr. Chatterton joined Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada in Lethbridge in July of 2011 as the Pulse and Special Crops Pathologist. Her research focuses on management of root and foliar diseases of pulse crops and molecular diagnostics and identification of soil-borne pathogens. She currently leads numerous research projects on pea root rot, white mold of dry bean, and chocolate spot of fabidine. Besides her passion for pulse diseases, she also has a passion for cooking with pulses, and particularly trying all sorts of different tricks to get her kids to eat them. She will be providing an update on her research program on Aphanomyces root rot, starting with a summary of the four years of the survey work in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and continuing with research on determining threshold concentrations that cause disease. And finally, the field distribution of Aphanomyces. She will address challenges and the lessons that have been learned from her research trials um, aim mainly at evaluating management options for Aphanomyces root rot to help us agronomists as well as certified crop advisors as well as growers in terms of dealing with the problem. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Chatterton. Okay, good afternoon everyone. Um, as Sherilyn said, thank you for uh, joining this webinar. Uh, it's great to see uh, so much um, interest and interaction about uh, root rot of pulses, even if we have to do it from afar. I think this webinar was uh, very well timed um, as we're all uh, learning to do things virtually on the internet. Um, so I'm going to start out uh, here just showing an overview of what I'm hoping to talk about in the next uh, 50 minutes or so with leaving hopefully about 10 minutes for questions at the end. Um, so I've given a lot of presentations on root rot in, in the past few months uh, and so I really tried to try to focus on a few different aspects. Maybe um, some of you have already seen my presentations before and I didn't want to have a repeat so I've really tried to drill down for this presentation on some of the biology of both the Phanomyces eutyches um, and Fusarium species. So I'll be looking um, in detail at some of their disease cycles, uh, what makes them uh, very successful pathogens. Uh, then we'll look at the host range of both of these different pathogens and then look at some of the interaction and how that um, is contributing to our problem. Uh, and then I hope to spend about 10 minutes 10 to 15 minutes or so uh, the last uh, bit of the presentation uh, talking, giving a research update on some of the field trials. Um, this is something that I presented recently at the Plant Health Summit in Saskatoon, so I didn't want to repeat that and focus uh, too much um, on the same things. So uh, just starting with a general introduction of root rots of pea and lentil, um, I think by now we all know uh, that this has been a widespread problem. Uh, in the prairies, uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba since about 2011, 2012, um, you know, we really started to see those pick up in 2013, uh, where we see extensive uh, yellowing of field crops. We often see it starting in patches and then spreading 
uh, here throughout the whole field. Um, and here we can see how it's kind of a hilltop here, and you can see the yellowing start to move down um, uh, as you get excess moisture. And then when we pull those roots uh, for both peas and lentils, uh, we see a lot of degradation and decay of the root system, uh, particularly uh, for peas and advanced stages, uh, you'll often see that there's no roots left at all. Um, and then if there are roots, there'll be uh, a, a huge loss of the root mass. You see this honey uh, caramel browning and often this blackening of the tap root. Um, and as I go on and talk about some of the symptoms of the Sanomyces and Fusarium, it'll become clear why we see that. Uh, and then here's an example for lentils. Uh, sometimes they don't look uh, quite as um, distinct as it does on peas, and maybe the damage isn't quite as severe, but certainly uh, we see the same impact on yield. And here we can see that sort of blackening, browning of the, uh, the, the tap root, and then the loss of that, the lateral root mass. And so I'm gonna start off by talking about um, Athanomyces eutyches, uh, which I think by now has become a household name for anyone that, has, uh, that grows pulses or has grown pulses for a number of years. Um, and this was kind of our unexpected surprise, as I said, in about 2012 in Saskatchewan and 2013 in Alberta, uh, we really um, started to pay attention to this pathogen and that is when uh, we first uh, reported it in these provinces. Uh, so what makes this such a damaging and destructive pathogen and why was it um, suddenly present um, everywhere uh, that we looked for it in a lot of these pea and lentil crops? Uh, and so to understand that, uh, you know, we have to look at the biology uh, and understand the disease cycle of this pathogen. And it's a little bit unusual because this pathogen falls into a group uh, that is called uh, the water molds. Um, and as we look a little bit um, into the, the life cycle, we'll understand why it's called a water mold. And so the pathogen starts, um, our primary inoculum here, our initial inoculum, are these oospores uh, that you should be able to see on your screen. They're very uh, thick walls. Uh, they kind of have this dense uh, lipid droplet in the center, and that provides them the energy they need to be able to survive a long time. And then they have this very thick double cell wall uh, surrounding the center. And that really makes them resistant to a lot of environmental uh, degradation and be able to survive for a long time. And so these oospores will sit in the soil, uh, go into dormancy, sit there uh, for a long time and really do nothing until we add some of the key ingredients. And those key ingredients are a susceptible crop, uh, in this case, uh, pea and lentils. And, um, a few slides later, I'm gonna talk about maybe what some of those other uh, hosts are as well. And so once you plant a pea or lentil into this field and the root, the seeds start to germinate and you have these nice juicy roots sending out a lot of signals, um, that tells the oospores that they can germinate because there's a, a food source for them. And so the oospores will start germinating, but they won't really do too much until you also add water. And so once you get this mix of water um, and nice juicy pea roots, the oospores start doing their thing. And what they do is they germinate to produce these long structures. Um, and this is a nice picture here, uh, because if you imagine the oospores down here, they start pumping out uh, these little zoospores along these long uh, structures here called hyphae. And then these kind of accumulate at the top of uh, this structure. And then once they've all accumulated, a Hopefully this video works for everyone. Um, you can start to see them swim. And here we can see them swimming along. Uh, then all of a sudden we'll see a whole bunch. And so there they are swimming towards uh, these pea roots. So the zoospores are attracted to um, their pea and, and lentil roots. And once they start infecting, uh, they can infect very quickly. And then within seven to 10 days, they can kind of um, colonize and ramify through the whole root. And then it gets to this point where there's really not much nutrients left and they have to go back into dormancy and they'll sit there and wait for the next pea or lentil crop. Uh, so there's a lot of key aspects of this disease cycle, uh, which has made aphanomyces uh, the pathogen that it is. Um, and one of those is that, it, as I said, it requires uh, the presence of a host to break dormancy. And so what that means is that it can be very long lived in the soil until you have your next susceptible crop. Uh, back in the early 90s, uh, one of the pathologists did some math on this and calculated that roughly an oospore has a half-life of approximately one year. So they do, even though they're quite uh, resistant to, to the environment, they do 
and naturally decay over time. But doing the math was showing that um, they decay, half of them decay every year, uh, showed that it takes about eight to 10 years for them to decay below threshold levels that cause disease. Uh, the other thing that's important is that oothworts can infect roots directly, uh, but they often don't. And if they do, it means that the amplitude of infection will be lower. Um, and that's because zoospores are the multiplier stage. Um, and then with some research that we've done in our lab, um, and it kind of co corroborated other research done in France and the US, uh, generally we find that the threshold for disease to develop is approximately 100 oospores per gram of soil. Uh, and that's a fairly low number for a soil-borne pathogen, but that's because oospores are not the direct infecting structures. Like I said, they have to rely on the, on the zoospores uh, for infection. Um, and I've shown uh, this data before, so I'm just gonna show a picture quickly rather than going into all of the, um, the research and the methods that we did to test it out. But really, I think um, I've shown this picture a lot. It is one of my favorites um, because it shows what happens when you reach threshold. Here we have uh, pea plants that were grown at very low levels of oospores. I think we had uh, one, 10, and 50 here. And then as soon as we hit that 100, you can see that jump from a seemingly healthy plant here, and then all of a sudden it's disease. And then once you increase those oospore levels, uh, the disease level gets worse, but it, it, you know, it plateaus out pretty quickly. So that's just showing how important it is um, to get to that threshold and what happens when you get there, and then how difficult it is to be able to bring it back towards uh, these lower levels of oospores where your, your pea plants might do fine. Um, and so the other key aspects, like I said, are that zoospores are uh, the multiplier stage. So even if you only need 100 oospores um, as a threshold, you know, if those 100 oospores are producing, um, you know, maybe 1,000 zoospores each, you can see why you can get this, this huge kind of wave of infection uh, that's coming. Uh, and then the zoospores do require saturated soil to be able to swim and find uh, those pea or lentil roots. Um, and so oftentimes um, the oospores can germinate, but they'll just sit there until you get water. And then once the water's there, you can get infection very quickly. Uh, and so this is why infection can occur at every any time over the growing season, um, because basically when there's water there, the zoospores will be active. Um, it's important to note, and I think everybody uh, does know this by now, is that lentils are just as susceptible as pea. I do tend to focus a little more on pea um, as I talk through my presentation, and that's just because we're doing more of our research. Um, but um, it's important to remember that lentils are, are just as susceptible and are not kind of an acceptable uh, rotation crop uh, with peas uh, because you will just increase the phanomyces. Uh, and so based on some of these aspects of the disease cycle, you know, what we can hypothesize and certainly what we've seen is that soil moisture, the presence of adequate soil moisture or excess soil moisture in the growing season um, and the crop history. So how many times you've grown a pea or a lentil crop in the field are really the most important uh, drivers of disease. And that's really what's going to determine uh, your risk. Um, it's some of the unknowns of the Athanomyces disease cycle, and these are things that we're starting to try to focus on a little more with the research. Uh, to really uh, drill down into some of the fine details uh, is currently, uh, we don't really know what that decay rate of oospores are. Uh, like I said, uh, there was a paper in the early 90s that sort of calculated it uh, mathematically, uh, but it's never been looked at in the field to see how quickly these are actually decaying and how different soil environments might influence that. So if we have extreme dry conditions that we've had in the past, um, couple summers or sometimes even extreme wet conditions if you can get anaerobic conditions, uh, really cold soil temperatures in the winter, uh, how are these are all um, uh, allowing oospores to decay or, or how they react under those conditions. Uh, and then in order to do that, it's really important to be able to measure the viable oospores in soil. Some of our detection and quantification methods right now, uh, we're just measuring everything that's in there and we don't know how many of those are actually viable. So in order to create better thresholds, we need to understand how many um, are actually viable in the soil at a time. Uh, and then I said that crop history was a very important uh, driver of disease, but it's been really hard to kind of find and collect data on specifically on that to know well, what is the frequency of pea or lentil crop. 
that leads to kind of reaching or surpassing those inoculum thresholds. Um, and it's difficult to do that because it's been difficult to collect uh, kind of historical data going back 20 to 25 years to see how often um, pea or lentils may have been grown in a particular field. Uh, and then the other thing that's interesting and another un kind of an unknown is the interaction between field characteristics and the rate of increase of soil inoculum. You know, we've talked to many producers or surveyed fields well, they have one field that looks just fine and another field that can have a lot of aphanomyces and it's really hard to know sometimes uh, what is the difference between that. Um, and we've tried to do some correlations um, and haven't really come up with any clear answers on what some of those soil characteristics are that might lead to a field being a lot more infested than another. Uh, and then the other one is alternate hosts. And I'm going to talk about that in the next couple slides uh, is whether some of the other legume crops um, might be contributing to inoculum potentials in the soil. Uh, and so I'm going to focus on host range of Athanomyces, particularly on alfalfa. Uh, and this is because I've gotten a number of questions uh, about this in the past, uh, really this year, it's really come up as, as an important question. Um, and it's something that we don't quite have a handle on, and, and partly because there's not a lot of information out there about alfalfa. Um, but a couple of years ago, we had done a host range study with a number of different alfalfa varieties, uh, and those are down here. Uh, the problem is it's really hard to kind of gather the data on what alfalfa varieties are most commonly grown. So these are ones that we were able to pull from the breeding program at Lethbridge. Um, and so if we look at meadow here as P, I used it um, as our positive control. And what I've done here is looked at the difference uh, from inoculated, the disease severity of a inoculated plant versus a non-inoculated plant and that's partly because alfalfa doesn't establish very well in the greenhouse so the roots look a little bit um, iffy anyway so we had to look at uh, how did that compare to non-inoculated and so we can see meadow is very high but then alfalfa um, you know we kind of see the, the numbers all over the place with these different varieties so there does seem to be some differential kind of resistance susceptibility and then we also looked at measuring oospores in alfalfa to see if, you know, to indicate whether they're a good host or not. And I plotted the oospore bars here in this light green um, against this axis here. And what's interesting is that there really doesn't seem to be a clear correlation between the number of oospores that we can measure in the root uh, versus the disease severity. So for something here like uh, AC Dalton, which had fairly high disease severity. And you can see that in the picture here, the roots really didn't look um, that great. They had actually a fairly high level of oospores. So we know that that would be a susceptible variety. But then AC Blue Jay here actually had very low disease severity. Uh, looked, uh, the roots look quite nice. These are the inoculated roots here. They actually supported a uh, fairly high level of oospores. Uh, now I should mention that I didn't graph the number of oospores for peas because it was about up to 75 or 100 and the graph would do, they just shoot off the graph. But so definitely lower levels of oospores in alfalfa than pea, but we can see that some varieties do support that. Um, and if we go back and look at the literature, I think what's interesting is that there is um, kind of a relationship between where the Aphanomyces isolated originated from and what its pathogenicity is. So if we look at Aphanomyces isolates from peas, we can see that they are pathogenic to peas and to alfalfa and not so much beans. But then if we look at um, Aphanomyces isolates from alfalfa, there's, they fall into different races, a race one and a race two that have been characterized. And so Aphanomyces isolates of alfalfa from race one are infective to pea and to alfalfa, whereas alfalfa, Aphanomyces isolates of alfalfa that are race two are not pathogenic to peas, whereas they are to alfalfa. Um, so there's a complicated story here with alfalfa that I think we haven't quite uh, figured out and maybe we'll try to look to do that in the future. Uh, and then what's interesting is that in the US, alfalfa varieties are labeled, whether they're resistant to race one or race two of, of aphanomyces, whereas Canadian varieties, I guess it hasn't really been a problem. Um, so they haven't been tested. Maybe we have some of the same varieties in the US, um, but kind of that response is unknown. And then without getting too much into it, we did test Sanflan and fenugreek and found that these appear to be resistant. Uh, same with chickpea, soybean, and fava bean, and I'm gonna talk about those uh, later in the presentation. Uh, and then the other thing is that we tested a number of legume species that kind of have interest in this 
uh, cover crops, and I know there's a lot of growing interest in using cover crops now for sustainable agriculture. Uh, and so we just wanted to caution uh, the choice of cover crops, particularly legume cover crops, because some of them can be a very good host for phanomyces. And that particularly is the vetches. So we can see here all the vetches had very high disease severity. And when we looked at the number of phanomyces in the root, they were very high sometimes even higher. If we look at P down here, we can see that chicken vetch had very high levels of the phanomyces. Uh, so caution on vetches, use the cover crop, and I know sometimes vetches can be weedy species as well. Um, and so, you know, that would indicate um, maybe some, some ways that the phanomyces is being maintained in field. Uh, and then we also looked at clovers, and clovers weren't as clear cut. Some of them, you know, had very low disease severity, but then we could detect the phanomyces in the root. And then uh, others, low disease severity, but also no aphanomyces. Um, and so uh, just a word of caution, I guess, on, on choosing cover crop species. And then just what these look like um, here, yellow blossom and crimson clover, which did support some aphanomyces. Uh, we can see that the roots actually looked very healthy. And then something like bursine clover, where we didn't find any aphanomyces, the roots actually had uh, some, sort of, uh, some sort of root rot maybe caused by something else. And then Persian clover was one that we were unsure of. And then the vetches we can see uh, look really not very good at all. Um, you know, the disease severity would be on par with what we see uh, with peas. So again, uh, caution there. Um, so next I'm gonna talk uh, just very briefly about a project uh, that I did in collaboration with Dr. Luke Baynard at, at AFC and Swift Current. And what we did here was try to correlate some of the factors um, soil factors, uh, some of the soil characteristics, uh, and relate that to a phanomyces eutyches levels in the soil in Saskatchewan. Uh, and this was done in conjunction with our 2016 root rot survey for pea and lentil. Uh, and so basically anywhere where you see a circle is where um, my group had gone out and collected roots, surveyed them for a phanomyces, given them a disease severity rating. Uh, and then Luke's group went out and soil sampled from all of these. And so anywhere you see a big red circle, that means those had very high levels of aphanomyces in the soil, um, orange a little lower, and then if you get all the way down to these, uh, the little small green circles, uh, means fairly low levels. And so they took all those, these, uh, after we had characterized both the root rot levels and the aphanomyces levels in the soil, we wanted to see how that related to crops, so that was pea or lentils. Uh, to some of the soil properties, and then also to cropping history. So I'm going to show you some of that um, data now. Uh, and we'll start out with what we saw with the root rot surveys for pea versus lentil. Um, and this, this uh, project was done in 2016, which was a very wet year. And so if we look at uh, the prevalence, so that's the percent of fields that were infected with aphanomyces in 2016, uh, we can see it was very high, about 65% for pea and about 70% for lentil. And then if we look at incidence, which is the percent of samples, of root samples that were positive, we can see on average about 55% for peas and about 60% for lentils. Uh, and so that was a good year to do this study because uh, we were able to go out and then correlate that with soil levels. Um, but I wanted to include 2017 data here uh, just to illustrate what the effect of dry weather can be uh, because 2017 was a much drier year than 2016. And so we can see that the prevalence and incidence of aphanomyces in pea and in lentils uh, really did decrease a fair amount compared to 2016. And particularly, we see a more dramatic uh, decrease in lentils in 2017. Um, and we saw the same pattern for both pea and lentil in Saskatchewan in 2018. And then unfortunately, we all know that 2019 uh, ended up being a fairly wet year. And then we do see these numbers uh, come back up to be fairly high prevalence and incidence in a wet year. And then again, just to kind of drive home this idea that pea and lentil are both susceptible, um, here we can see kind of pictures of uh, root rot of lentils kind of in the early stage, seedling stage where you just start to see a little bit of browning on the lateral root, and we see the same thing for peas. And then when we get to the more advanced stages, you start to see that decay of the root system. Uh, and so we took this data, we knew what the root rot levels were for pea and lentil in 2016, and so they went and also looked at uh, what the levels of aphanomyces were in this per gram of soil. 
Uh, and then what's interesting is that for lentil fields, uh, they were the euthanomyces levels in the soil were actually actually lower than what we saw for pea fields. So for lentil fields, on average, they were just about at that threshold here with 100, um, 100 units of euthanomyces per gram of soil. And then pea, we can see we're actually tenfold higher than that, a little bit closer uh, to 1,000. Uh, so why we kind of see that difference in the soil levels, I think is unknown, um, and maybe just has to do with the fact that lentils seem to stand up a little bit better in dry weather compared to peas. Uh, and here's just a, um, a, a comparison of lentils and peas. These are actually grown side by side in one of our field trials. Uh, and you can see what the symptoms look like there. Uh, and then the other thing we looked at was the soil property and how this correlated with different, um, how, how disease correlated with different soil properties. Uh, we found that there was a positive correlation with clay, soil moisture, uh, total nitrogen, and total carbon. Um, and this is likely because as plants are diseased, they're actually not using uh, some of that, those nutrients that are in the soil. So it's like it gets left behind and then it appears that there's higher amount. And then interestingly, we saw no effect of previous crop, uh, and that was primarily canola or wheat, which was the previous crop. Uh, no effective tillage, uh, no effective soil zone. Uh, so even though soil moisture was correlated, uh, soil zone was not. And then these soil properties also had no effect. Uh, and then like I think I had mentioned at the beginning, it was impossible to kind of pull out data on rotation frequency and how that affected it, because it was hard to get a complete data set. And I'm going to talk about some of the field trials that we're trying to do to, to uh, understand that better. Uh, so I'm going to wrap up here talking about aphanomyces uh, and just kind of give a brief summary of what I talked about. Uh, I think we all know that aphanomyces is here to stay and it's going to continue to challenge pulse production. There is a lot of research going on to how we can best mitigate this situation. Um, and I think there's a lot of exciting things on the horizon. Um, part of the part of one of the reasons this is such a challenging pathogen is because the dew spore dose is low, the threshold dose is low because it relies on these dew spores, dew spores as the multipliers. And because we've had a lot of fields that have had a long a history of pea and lentil crops. We do see some improvement in dry years, especially for lentil. Um, the host range is limited to some legume species and we're kind of still trying to work on this alfalfa, sort of the question of alfalfa. So this is just a reminder now that if you have questions, to send them to Cheryl in, um, and then we will address them all at the, uh, the end of the session. And then I'm going to turn over and talk about fusarium species, uh, probably for the next uh, 15 minutes or so before I talk about um, some of our field trials. So why are fusarium species important? Um, and I think I've shown this slide a lot. Some of you may have seen it before. Um, but basically what this is showing is that when we look at our whole collection of fields that we've surveyed over the past um, five, six years now, um, and we start plotting them, uh, we see about 55% of our fields have a phanomyces uh, plus some sort of fusarium species uh, for peas and then very similar for lentils, about 40% of our, our fields. So fusarium is almost always, aphanomyces almost always co-occurs with fusarium. And then on top of that, we have another subset of fields here, about close to 50%, where we only find fusarium species. And then very rarely, you can see this blue bar here, are fields where we found just aphanomyces without any fusarium involved. So clearly, you know, in 98% of our fields, uh, fusarium is a problem. Um, and I think that we tend to put all the focus on aphanomyces because it is the more damaging pathogen and we see the effects uh, more readily, um, but it's important to, to also pay attention uh, to fusarium. Um, and part of the problem is that fusarium is complicated. It's a big group of species um, and not all the species do the same thing and maybe are associated with different hosts or have preferential hosts. Uh, and this is just an example of fusarium species that we pulled out from roots from our 2019 survey in Saskatchewan. Uh, and so we can see here about seven uh, different species, uh, usually Avanaceum here, uh, Redolins and Ossisporum tend to be the ones that we find with the highest frequency. Uh, so about 90%. Um, and then they kind of, this is Griminiarum here and Calmorum, which tend to be more associated with wheat. And I am gonna talk about the host range on the next couple slides. 
Uh, and so we also did some uh, pathogenicity tests with some of these species to see which ones are, you know, maybe the ones that we should be more concerned about. Um, and I'm going to show you the results, and then I'm going to tell you in the next couple slides why the results are maybe uh, wrong. But anyway, I'll just show you the results now, and then we'll talk about some of the intricacies of this um, pathogen. So if we look at the disease severity here, which is these little black bars, uh, these little black cubes, uh, we can see that the disease severity is actually quite high for most of these species. And we did find that it was the highest for Avanasium and Solani. So I tend to focus now most of my research on Avanasium and Solani. Uh, at least that was the plan. Uh, Solani has been reclassified as a risk group two pathogen, which means that it can um, cause, has some health implications for humans. So you need special labs to study that. So unfortunately, we can no longer uh, study Solani. Uh, so I would focus most of our attention on Avanasium here because it is um, you know, very prevalent and causes fairly high disease. But when we look at these other ones like Redolins and Oxisporum, which are also fairly prevalent, you know, they can cause disease in their own right. Um, but I'll talk about some of our screening techniques and how that affects the outcome. And then we get some of the other ones like Acuminatum and Calmorum, uh, which are, are moderately pathogenic. And we unfortunately didn't test uh, Graminiarum uh, for, for pathogenicity on P. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the fusarium disease cycle now, um, and at first it's going to seem really simple, and then I'll show you how much more complicated it gets. Uh, so fusarium, this is just, this is fairly general because there's so many species, but fusarium can also produce resting spores here called uh, chlamydospores. They are not as resistant as the Phanomyces oospores, and Avanasium doesn't actually produce resting spores. But all fusarium species produce these kind of spores, which are called macroconidia. And so this is kind of the initial inoculum, and these will be present in soil. Um, unlike a phanomyces, in order for a fusarium root, or in order for a root to come into contact with fusarium, it actually has to go, grow through the soil and then hit that um, inoculum structure as it's growing. So it's not like a phanomyces where you can have uh, where it's not moving towards the root, the root has to grow towards the inoculum. Uh, and so once the root comes into contact with one of these uh, inoculum structures, uh, then you get disease. And then a fairly simple, these get returned back as, as the disease um, progresses, you know, these, these structures get returned back to the, the soil. Um, but as I said, it's simple and then it gets complicated because there's a lot of unknowns in our fusarium disease cycle. And one of them is the role of seed contamination and how that impacts root rot. Uh, I think a lot of the data that comes out of the seed testing labs shows that Fusarium avanasium particularly can be quite high on pea seeds. Fortunately, that appears that that is mostly that seed inoculation, inoculum is mostly taken care of um, by a seed treatment. And so we're still not, it's still not totally clear how much seed inoculum is contributing to root rot, uh, because in the lab, it seems like a seed treatment just basically gets rid of that seed contamination. Uh, but then some of the unknowns uh, with our simple disease cycle is really what is the role that crop residue is playing in the disease cycle of fusarium. Uh, certainly because fusarium avanasium doesn't produce these resting structures here, it has no way of overwintering really, so it has to overwinter on crop residue is primarily uh, where it's thought to survive. And so then the question is, how does crop residue, um, what's its role in root rot? And then also, what's the infection kind of pathway of the seeds? I think that is also unknown. Um, it's, it's one of those interesting facts, I guess, that it tends to, Fusarium avanasium tends to produce primarily a root rot in peas. So how is it moving from the root and up into the shoots and contaminating those seeds. And then if it's getting up into the shoots, how is that contributing to this initial inoculum stage where we find that there's a lot of fusarium avanasium on crop residue? So another pathway between root rot, uh, roots to shoots uh, for this pathogen, I think is, is really unknown. And then the role that crop residue is playing um, in the disease cycle, I think is also something that is unknown at this, at this point. <clears throat> 
Um, and so that brings me to this question of seed uh, versus soil inoculum. Um, and we started out, remember what I said a couple slides ago, that maybe what we had done was wrong when we were looking at fusarium pathogenicity, because what we had done was use this seed soak method. And so what you do is you take your pea seeds and you soak them in your fusarium inoculum. So you get nice little uh, fusarium propules on your seeds and you grow out your plant and basically the roots come out uh, diseased and the plants really look terrible using this method. Uh, so here's a picture here. Uh, this is CDC meadow. So this one, when we do a seed inoculation method, we can see that the seeds barely uh, come out of the ground. Uh, very, very poor emergence. Uh, and then contrast that to CDC Dakota, which is a dun colored pea, and it actually seems to do, uh, it does better. It does better than meadow anyway. And usually once they kind of grow out of this stage, the plants can actually survive and be totally healthy. Um, and so this is the method that we use to test all the, the pathogenicity of all those different um, fusarium species that we had pulled out. Now what's interesting is there's another method that we're just starting to play around with. Um, that's, this is called the cornmeal layering method. Well, basically we take our pot and then we layer uh, some fusarium inoculum in the middle of the pot so that when we plant a healthy, uh, disease-free or pathogen-free seed, that root that comes out can be healthy and it has to go through that inoculum layer uh, in order to become diseased. And this is more reflective of what's actually happening in the field where the root has to come into contact with the fusarium inoculum in order for root rot to start. And then when we look at that, we can see that we're getting much more uh, reflective symptoms of what we're seeing out in the field, where you get that blackening of the tap root rather, this, rather than this kind of complete um, uh, degradation of the seed. And then what's interesting is when we use this method, we can see that then there's not really a lot of difference between meadow um, and Dakota or with the, the pea plants that have this kind of dun colored pea. Um, and that's because they're not getting that protection uh, from the, from the, uh, the seed coat. Uh, so we're, we're starting to evaluate more of our research uh, using this method because it seems to be more reflective of what's actually happening in the field. And then what we find is that if you have fusarium inoculum on your seed, put on a seed treatment, it actually takes care of this problem very well. So the root rot is more reflective of this uh, kind of an inoculum. Uh, so some of the key aspects of the fusarium disease cycle, um, there are many different species of fusarium. They all have a very similar disease cycle. Um, most of the species, except for fusarium avanaceum, uh, does produce resting spores but those resting spores are not um, as hardy and as long-lived as the resting spores of the Phanomyces. Um, Fusarium avanaceum, because it doesn't produce resting spores, is likely surviving on crop residue. Uh, and I think this is still a big kind of research question here is, is how that contributes to disease. Uh, Fusarium is common on seeds. Uh, that infection pathway and how it gets to the seeds is unclear but the seed contamination does seem to be managed by seed treatment and likely isn't a huge contributor to um, root rot problems that occur later in the field season. And um, these are likely um, from roots moving through the soil and coming to contact uh, with inoculum. Uh, but because of this difference in susceptibility of, of pea plants, um, if they were infected by a seed versus a root infection, I think it's very important that we pay attention to that when we're doing some of our research and some of the conclusions uh, that are drawn from that research. Uh, so next I'm going to talk about host range, particularly of Fusarium solani and Fusarium avanaceum, uh, because like I said, those are the ones that appear to be the most aggressive. Uh, fortunately, we did this work with Fusarium solani before it was reclassified as a risk group two agent, so we were able to pull a little bit of data out on it. Uh, and what we did was we wanted to look at the host range of these Fusarium species. First, we looked at pulses, and then I'll show you some data later on uh, some non-pulse crops. Uh, but so we looked at soybean here in gray, fava bean in black, chickpea, a, a few different varieties of chickpea here in yellow, a couple different types of lentil, and then also pea here as our susceptible check. And what we can see is that uh, we looked at emergence, and then we looked at disease severity over here. Uh, soybean did very well in the presence of Fusarium solani, whereas fava beans did not. Uh, fairly poor emergence fairly high disease severity. 
Uh, chickpea really seemed to be dependent on the cultivar, with console doing quite well, and then Orion didn't even emerge. Uh, and then we can kind of see that um, we, did, we couldn't even take disease severity for Orion since nothing had emerged. And then lentils, again, did quite well in the presence of Fusarium solani, very high emergence, uh, very low disease severity. And then if we look at uh, Avanaceum, uh, very similar pattern. Uh, soybean, very good emergence, very low disease severity in the presence of Avanaceum. Fava bean, fairly low emergence, fairly high uh, disease severity. And then the same kind of differential response with chickpea, whereas in this case, leader, uh, we didn't get emergence at all in the presence of Fusarium avanaceum. And then certainly we saw that the emergence uh, was reduced um, for the other varieties. And then uh, for the red lentils, again, we see a reduction in emergence with Fusarium avanaceum, whereas disease severity wasn't very low, uh, was fairly low. And then a green lentil here in power actually did uh, didn't seem to have any effect of a Fusarium avanaceum. So um, I guess more of a complicated kind of host range uh, for these Fusarium species uh, that really seems to be dependent on cultivars. Uh, and so then I get the question a lot about Fusarium species and other crops. Um, and again, this is a very uh, complicated question and a complicated answer. Um, and so I've tried to make it as simple as possible. And basically for Fusarium solani, we can say no. It does not, we don't see it on other crops outside of the pulse, um, outside of the, the pulses that I showed you before. Um, and that's because Fusarium solani is kind of broken up into these different strains or isolates, and different isolates have different hosts. So for our part, what we mainly see on peas is Fusarium solani. It's called Forma sessialis pizzi. And that means that it's specific to pea, so we don't see it on some of the other non-pulse crops. But then even though it's supposed to be specific to pea, uh, as I showed you on those previous uh, slides, you can see it on some of the other pulse crops, particularly uh, fava bean seems to be susceptible. And then for Fusarium avanaceum, I think this is kind of the big challenge and question right now is exactly what its cross pathogenicity is. So I'd say, yes, it's on other crops, um, but, and I'll show you the but on the next slide, um, you know, it's been reported on cereal, cereal grains. It's becoming increasingly a part of the Fusarium head, head light complex. Uh, I think a lot of the cereal pathologists aren't exactly sure what it's doing on there or how it's contributing to the Fusarium head light complex, but certainly they find it in Canada, France, Finland, a lot of new re more reports of this um, avanaceum uh, coming up more and more on cereal, cereal grains. Uh, it, is a, it can be a pathogen on canola causing root rot, uh, but it's not a huge problem. I think there was some reports of it uh, maybe in the early to mid 2000s and then it hasn't really popped up again. Uh, we see it causing some uh, di even diseases on potatoes and tuber storage diseases. So it can be quite a broad host range of crops. But when we took our pea isolates and we tried to test them on a cereal and canola crops, we really found that it, they weren't that pathogenic. Um, and I'm not showing you the whole list of, of uh, we tested a whole bunch of different cultivars and just um, for brevity's sake here, I've just shown a small list. But really, um, when we look at emergence, and this is compared, I didn't show, I haven't shown the non-inoculated results, but this was, they were very comparable to the non-inoculated um, crops where there wasn't any significant difference in emergence levels. Uh, and then again, disease severity levels, very low. Uh, and then I've shown Fusarium solana here, which we know is not a pathogen of any of these crops. And we can see that the emergence and disease severity is very similar to what we saw for Avanaceum. So the question is, well, are isolates maybe that are coming from pea or from a lentil, are they pathogenic to other crops? Um, is it the inoculation method? You know, we're testing them as a root rot pathogen because that's what we see in peas, but are they actually a shoot pathogen on cereals? So there's a lot of questions here about this uh, differential pathogenicity of Fusarium avanaceum, how it's carrying over, if it's carrying over between crops, or whether we're starting to move towards some specialization. So I think a big uh, avenue for research here is just that there's uh, not a lot of time to get all this research done.
Um, and so I'm going to end off this fusarium section talking about interactions between uh, fusarium and aphanomyces. Uh, and this is one of my favorite pictures because it so clearly demonstrates uh, kind of what's happening with aphanomyces versus fusarium species. So here we can see plants infected with aphanomyces. Uh, fusarium redolens is actually very weakly pathogenic. The plants almost look completely healthy. Uh, you add the aphanomyces to there and then really all you're seeing is uh, Aphanomyces gets a little bit worse. Uh, here is an example of very clear fusarium symptoms where we just see that blackening of the tap root. The lateral roots, roots look pretty healthy, but you add aphanomyces into the mix, and then you get what we see a lot in the fields where you get these honey brown discoloration of the lateral roots, and then you get the blackening of the tap root. So, just to present that graphically here, um, I'll walk you through what we're looking at. So, first, disease severity of a check, very low, um, and then disease severity of a phantomyces, very high. Uh, so our max on the scale here is five. And then if we look at fusarium redolins, again, disease severity very low, comparable to the check. You add a phantomyces in there, and it's higher, but not really that much higher than a phantomyces on its own. And then it starts getting interesting over here. So fusarium solani causes a lot of disease on its own. You add a phantomyces and you see that, see that disease severity levels are starting to creep up. Uh, the same with uh, Fusarium avanaceum causes a lot of disease on its own. You add a phantomyces and again, uh, here not significantly different, but we can see the disease severity levels creeping up. Uh, and then the last bar here, when you put all four of your pathogens together, uh, we can see that the disease severity is significantly higher than what we saw with the phantomyces alone. So having all of these pathogens together um, is really, uh, really drives that severity and is why we see uh, uh, so much damage in the field. Um, and then the other interesting thing is we've been tracking how the condition changes over time. Um, and in June, we see very high levels of the phantomyces on the roots, fairly low levels of fusarium. Um, and this would be about mid-June, about six weeks after planting or so. And then if we look at, in, um, if you look at the roots, they look very classical with anomyces symptoms. And then if we look a little bit later towards uh, flowering, uh, kind of July, mid-July, you can see that those anomyces levels are going down and that it's being overtaken by fusarium. And that's when we really see it start to increase. And that's when you start to see roots look like this, where you get that blackening coupled with this honey brown discoloration. Uh, and so part of the problem, I think, why aphanomyces was missed for so long was that we we're often going in and doing surveys in mid-July. So usually it was after flowering is when you see the root rot look the worst because they look like this. But if you're going in in July, really all you're pulling out is fusarium and then thinking, well, fusarium was the problem and we're missing, missing that aphanomyces. So I'm just gonna wrap up this section on fusarium. Uh, and then I'll move on to field trials. Uh, and so basically in summary, we see that there's many different species of fusarium that can contribute to the root rot problem. Uh, and this is why it's been difficult to tackle this problem. It's hard to research. It's hard to know where to even start researching uh, when you have so many species involved. Uh, and so I've tried to simplify things by mostly focusing on fusarium avanaceum um, in the lab for research. Uh, but fusarium solani is also a very important component of this complex. It's just really hard. It's much harder to research. Um, and I think that there's still a lot of unknowns in fusarium and how it's contributing to root rots, particularly uh, the cross-pathogenicity of isolates between crops. Are we starting to see some host specialization or is fusarium avanaceum equally uh, pathogenic to all of our crop species? Uh, what that role of residue is, whether it's contributing to root rots or not, and then the movement and that, that pathway for seed contamination, I think, is still uh, fairly unknown. So this is just a reminder again that if you have any burning questions on the fusarium section to get them in to Cheryl Lynn, um, and we'll address them at the end. But now I think I have, oh, a few minutes to um, talk very briefly about research. Uh, so this is basically everything that my lab is researching right now. Um, if I was to talk about all of that research, we would be here for at least another hour. Um, I'm not sure if anybody wants that, even if maybe none of us have much else to do right now while we sit in our houses. Um, anyway, so I'm going to just focus today on 
uh, some of the field trials that we're doing with alternate pulse crops um, and really how that plays into this idea of rotation. And then also just a little bit of work that we're starting to do on liming. Um, just a very quick kind of cold note version of inputs. We looked at a number of different seed treatments. We looked at Fostrol, we looked at EDGE. We really were not able to pull out any significant differences, uh, consistent significant differences uh, from any of those treatments. So I didn't want to get too much into those results today. Um, and then cover crops, uh, this has been a challenging um, trial that I think can give us some really important information. Um, but we don't have any data on that yet. And hopefully next year uh, we will be able to, or sorry, this year, uh, if, um, if we're allowed to go out into the fields, hopefully this year we will have uh, some data from that cover crop trial. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the field trials. And I think um, a lot of people might be familiar with this already, but just as a reminder, uh, this, it's challenging doing field work because inoculated field trials just do not work. We can actually inoculate with fusarium, no problem. It takes really well. Uh, but for some reason, we cannot seem to inoculate with the phanomyces. We put down rot disease roots. We put down oodles of ooze spores into, into our um, a field site, a government field site, um, and just haven't been able to get the disease to take. Uh, and so we've had to go out to uh, producers, uh, producers locations to perform these field trials, but it means that we have uh, no healthy check, but we have been able to play around with length of time out of P, so kind of um, superimpose this idea of rotation on our field trials by choosing fields that last had P's at different times. And so what we're looking at is uh, rotation frequency and also inclusion of a non-host pulse crop as part of that rotation. So we selected sites that would give us kind of a one to eight year break between a pea crop by the time we're finished the trial. Um, and so, you know, right now we're kind of recommending a six to eight year break between pea and lentils. And so this will help us to see if that is um, a valid recommendation or not. And so we've chosen fields that will give us those different numbers. And then we use cereal and canola just as our standard rotational crop. And then we add in an alternate uh, with or without an alternate pulse crop. Um, and we chose in different pulse crops for different locations uh, just because we couldn't have trials that had like 120 treatments. Um, and so in, in Swift Current and Lethbridge, we're using chickpea as our alternate pulse crop. In Saskatoon and Macomb, we're using fava bean as our alternate pulse crop. And then in Red Rivers, Brooks, and Morden, we're using soybean as our ultimate pulse crop. And then what we're doing is assessing the roots of these different pulse crops and, and our P checks on the soil for pathogen levels. Um, and so I just have the first year of data from 2019. Um, and what this is showing you is, is we've taken, we collected soybean and pea roots from the two different locations. And then we look at the levels of Aphanomyces, Fusarium redolens, Fusarium solani, Fusarium avanaceum uh, that are present in the roots. And then we also um, give those a disease severity. So we can see that soybean at both locations supported very, very low levels of these root rot pathogens, and for the most part had very, had very low disease severities compared to peas. Um, and the trial, for some reason, worked the best at these locations. We had really high levels of aphanomyces, and we can see that soybean did not support aphanomyces at all. So pretty clear cut for soybean, and then it gets a little more complicated uh, when we look at fava bean. Um, and chickpea. Uh, so here's fava bean in Lacombe uh, and in Saskatoon. And we ended up with fairly low aphanomyces levels um, in Lacombe and in Saskatoon, but still we could see that fava bean did not support aphanomyces at all. So a good choice of uh, pulse crop that is not gonna support or add to it the, the aphanomyces levels. Um, but uh, like I showed you on those the grass for Fusarium host range, we can see that fava bean does support uh, some levels of Fusarium that are fairly similar to what we see for P. The fava bean have a much more robust P system, uh, sorry, much more robust root system. So we do tend to see that they um, kind of stand up a bit, a little bit better with even a little bit of disease pressure. And then finally for chickpea, uh, we grew at Tabor and at Swift Current. 
Um, again, a very nice story here in Tabor where we could see that peas had all sorts of these very high levels of these pathogens, the Phanomyces, Fusarium ritalin, Solani, and Avanasium, whereas chickpea really had very low levels of these pathogens uh, and very low levels of disease. Uh, a little bit different story in Swift Current where we did find fairly high levels of Solani on the chickpea, but again, it really didn't support um, a Phanomyces. Uh, so showing that these are good options for if you have a Phanomyces infested field, but this whole question of fusarium might come into play a little bit more with some of these alternate pulse crops. And so lastly, I'm just going to talk about liming, um, and this is because we got we had some very exciting results um, that I'm really excited to show. Uh, and so the whole idea behind liming or really the use of a calcium supplement is that it has been shown that calcium can prevent um, oospores from germinating to produce zoospores. So for whatever reason, calcium seems to inhibit uh, production of zoospores. It has been, lime, liming has been widely used in the U.S. and the sugar beet operations uh, to manage Aphanomyces root rot. And I think it's pretty standard practice uh, for sugar beet growers to use it there. Uh, the problem is a fairly high dose is needed to get those calcium levels up. And because sugar beets are grown with tillage anyway, this whole question of whether you need to till in the lime um, is unknown, but it does seem to prov provide long-term effects. I think they've shown, you know, you can add it once and you get an effect for about five years. Um, there's also evidence that's effective against club root, um, the liming, and that's more to do with pH than calcium. But it would be really great if we could manage these uh, two diseases uh, with one operation. So we did some uh, greenhouse trials and are hoping to maybe get out into the field uh, this year. We'll see whether uh, we can get back uh, to work in time for doing field trials. Um, but uh, we really saw some nice results with one of these lime products, the hydrated lime. Um, I think this is the one that has fairly uh, quick acting calcium, uh, we can see a really nice dose response here that as we increase the lime levels, you can see disease severity goes up from very high to very low, whereas we didn't see that same response with some of the other formulations of lime, and I think it has to do with calcium availability. Uh, and then in reverse, uh, what I was really happy to see because we've barely seen this in, field, in trials with any other product, is that we really saw an increase in that root weight as well. So again, we saw disease severity go down and we saw the root rates go up quite nicely. And they didn't see quite that same effect uh, with, uh, with the other products. Uh, and this is just what it looks like, a picture of what it looks like. You know, look at this here, these higher levels of, of lime, almost completely clean roots. And really what we're seeing here is a little bit of fusarium, uh, not really an effective aphanomyces when we see what that was like. Um, in naturally infested soil without any other hydrated lime product. So just in summary, I didn't show you the data, um, but we haven't seen seed treatments. Their efficacy, be, efficacy has been fairly variable, uh, not really any consistent results there over the past few years. Um, at some of our sites, we have seen a reduction in disease and increased yield after six to seven years. So that's good and encouraging because it tells us what that maybe recommendation for six to eight years uh, will be correct and is valid. Uh, soybean, fallow bean, and chickpea are good pulse crop options for aphanomyces for sure. Um, but fusarium is something that we're going to have to watch out for uh, because it could maybe still be a problem on some of these crops. Uh, just a reminder that if you are wanting to use legumes as cover crops, um, be careful on which ones you choose uh, because they can contribute to the problem rather than um, helping uh, with the resilient soils. Uh, and then finally, I think the greenhouse results from liming are very encouraging, but we have to take that out to the field. So trying to summarize up the past 50 minutes in, oops, that was a little longer than 50 minutes, sorry. Um, just trying to summarize it all up, what we see is that Aphanomyces uh, root rot is widespread across the prairies. The impact varies with moisture and crop choice. Uh, the inoculum threshold dose is low and that makes it more difficult to manage. Um, and unfortunately, our management options remain limited. Uh, field avoidance does work. We've shown that we can reduce inoculum levels after about seven years um, away from peas. Uh, the seed treatment aren't providing season-long control, um, and we are currently looking at research options to help reduce oospore levels. Uh, this is my lab group that 
does all the all the work for me as I come up with different crazy ideas for them to try. Uh, and then just thank all their funders and collaborators. And I'm sorry that I was trying to keep it to 50 minutes. And once I start talking root rots, I can't stop. But hopefully, yeah. Thank you, Shama. I think that was great information. And you know, as a person who has seen a lot of root rot talks and stuff, it was great to see some new information out there that you've been been working on and some of the results coming out as well. So we have a few questions. And just a reminder, if anybody has questions, enter them in the question section on the side. And we will cover as many as we can uh, in the next few minutes. So the first question is, will there be a checklist or a risk worksheet to help growers and agronomists determine the risk for root rots in their field? Yes, uh, that is what, so our decision support system, that is what we are, uh, the research is trying to work towards. Um, and that's partly why we're trying to get a handle on, you know, what that frequency of pea and lentil are in your field, because that'll be an important component. Um, and then the other thing that I'm trying to develop is also a soil test. So as part of those other risk factors, like soil moisture, previous crop history, I want producers to be able to go and take a soil sample, get their soil tested, and know what that oospore level is in their soil. Um, it's turning out that it's much more difficult to do that than I hoped. Uh, we had really good results for two years, three years, I think, and then we hit this dry cycle, and then all of a sudden, the results kind of fell off. So we're trying to come up with a more robust and accurate way of quantifying ooze bores. Thank you. Um, speaking of the, the lab tests and so forth, is there ability, can growers test the soils to know what fusarium pathogens are present or test the roots? Um, you talked about the Athanomyces side, but can, can growers or agronomists send in samples and know what fusarium pathogens they may have present? Um, that's a good question. We, I can definitely do that in my lab, and I know that I have shared some of those methods with uh, some of the seed testing labs, uh, like 2020 or BioVision, but I don't know yet whether they are offering that test or not. So I might have to check with some of those seed testing labs to see if they are doing that. Maybe that's something that... Um the pulse organizations can talk to the labs in the various different provinces about and follow up with them. Um, yes, absolutely. Another question uh, revolves around sort of the work that you did with seed quality and seed tests. And with tannins in the seed coat, your research suggests it only provides protection for seed borne diseases compared to soil borne. Is this yeah. accurate? And would you comment on the benefits of seed treatments? for those tannin type varieties? Oh, these are, these are tough questions. Um, yeah, certainly, you know, um, so how this all started is that we were doing um, assessments of germplasm lines to try to start breeding for resistance to fusarium. And we tested a whole bunch of lines and some of them, all the ones with the tannins in their seed coats looked like they had fairly good resistance. And then we brought them out to the field to do a field screening. And then all of a sudden we didn't see that same resistance level. You know, we actually checked the root rot so that, oh, okay, the root rots are very similar to meadow. Um, so that's why we've gone back into the lab and are developing a different screening method. But I don't know for sure if I could comment on you know, whether you should use a seed treatment for a tan uh, cultivar that has tannins, because we haven't tested that yet. Yeah, sorry, that's not a complete answer, but I don't want to no. say you don't need one if, if, uh, <laughs> if we haven't tested it, yeah. <laughs> no, that, it, it does make sense with what you're talking about in terms of the different tests and um, how you're evaluating that. So you mentioned kind of sort of screening varieties. There was a question regarding to screening of varieties and where um, breeders are at in terms of developing varieties that are resistant 
resistant to aphanomyces, particularly interested in the lentil side of things, as well mm -hmm. as the Yeah, so the, the, um, the breeding for aphanomyces uh, for lentil and peas is happening at the Crop Development Center at University of Saskatchewan. Um, so I can't give a lot of information on where they're at. I know I've talked to my colleagues there and they're, they're making good progress with pea, I think, and are hoping to have something to test fairly soon. And then my understanding with lentil is that um, it's at an earlier stage because they have to try to develop some resistance first. And I think they're screening uh, some of the wild lentil relatives. And Sherilyn, I don't know if you're more familiar with the, the progress or the project that's going on there. Um, just, I guess, that it, it's going to be years behind the peak because you, you're right, yeah. they had to start from scratch. Unfortunately, but that's good. Yeah. Um, now, just kind of going back to just the seed treatment side of things, um, did, do you have any comments regarding the work that you've done with the seed treatment such as Entego and its effect on Aphanomyces? Yeah, so I didn't show the data um, because it wasn't consistent. Um, basically, we did see some positive effect on root rot levels. Um, you know, it might have been three out of eight site years. Um, and particularly at the sites that had fairly low aphanomyces levels, we did see an improvement in root rot levels, but it didn't translate to an improvement in yield. Um, and that partly because, as like I said, we didn't have those healthy checks. And usually you have to compare yield to both a healthy and disease check, and we just can't do that. Um, and so we do see some improvement in root rot, but not necessarily in yield. Okay, thank you. So there's a few questions regarding the lime, um, using lime as a strategy. So the mm -hmm. first one, <clears throat> first one is, what if the soil pH is higher, like say seven and a half or eight, do you feel that liming could still be an effective factor? Yeah, um, so in this case, it's not the pH that is, has an effect on the disease, it's really the calcium levels. So it would depend on where, like if your pH is high because it has high calcium carbonate levels or whether it's high from some other chemistry. And I'll admit, uh, I'm not an expert in soil chemistry and pH. Um, and so, but the other thing that we're maybe hoping to look at is rather than just use a lime product, also use something uh, like gypsum or something else that modifies the calcium levels without affecting pH. And that'll tell us, um, that'll give us some answers or some clues as to, you know, the involvement of calcium versus pH. So it's hard to say at this point, um, if you know, if you, are, if you already have a high pH soil, what that impact will be on a phanomyces. Okay. Um, in terms of the lime rates that you did use in your, your greenhouse work, were, what mm -hmm. was the unit those would translate to in terms of tons per acre? Yeah, um, oh, I should have had those numbers in front of me, but I think the highest rate was about 11 to 12 tons per hectare. And then the lower rate was, I think, about two and a half tons per hectare. So it, it is fairly high rates, um, and I think one of the strategies for using lime would not necessarily be that you can spread it on your whole field, but use it more on hot spots, you know, when you start before the aphanomyces problem really is all over a field. So if you notice the yellow spot in your field, you could lime that particular area and make sure that it's not going to spread. Okay. Um, one other question is, so here's kind of the million dollar question. So if we have a grower that has never had peas for like over 40 years, but has some other fields that might be contaminated, should people be worried about field to field contamination? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, part of our the hypothesis right now is that aphanomyces is a native pathogen 
just present at very, very low levels. So if you start growing peas or lentils in a field and after you've grown them for 20 to 25 years, you'll probably have increased that inoculum level in your soil above threshold. But if you want to be able to slow that from happening, then I think you have to be very cautious about movement of soil from infested fields to clean, healthy fields. Uh, because what would happen is if you, you know, happen to bring in a, a clump of soil, it fell off a cedar or after you harvested, uh, and then you start a nice little patch, it's going to spread out a lot faster from that patch than if you just, then, then, then it would naturally increase. That makes sense. Yeah. Yep, that does. Thank you. I yeah. think we're going to end the questions um, after that one. There was some questions about reviewing a, um, a few of the slides that you presented, but just a reminder that this webinar is recorded and will be posted to the website so people can review whatever slides that they want at that time. So at this time, I'd like to thank you very much, Dr. Chatterton, for speaking today, all about what you know and what we still don't know, as well as Andrea, thank you for organizing today's session. Um, reminding everybody that an email will be sent out to get your CCA credits. And you also at that time have the opportunity to provide suggestions for future webinar topics. We really appreciate any feedback that you might have. Um, our next webinar is actually coming up on April 8th, where Clark Frenzel, Saskatchewan Provincial Weed Control Specialist, will talk about weed control and pulses. So you can sign up online on our SASPulse.com website under the news and events section. With that, I'd like to just say a big thank you to everyone who participated in this webinar today. Um, I hope that it, it helped to ease the feeling of isolation as we all do our part at this time. And if you have any further comments or anything, please provide them to Andrea in your response. Otherwise, have a great rest of the day and rest of the week. Thank you very much.